good. Okay. So tonight we're doing Majjhima Nikaya 107, Ganaka Moggallana Sutta, to Ganaka Moggallana. Thus have I heard. So it, the suttas always start out, thus have I heard, because this is part of a rigorous oral tradition leading back to the historical Buddha. And sutta means thread. So really, over the course of this retreat, you'll get a few different suttas, and you'll see how the pieces start to fit together. These are different teachings that the, the historical Buddha gave at one time or another. And this particular sutta is essentially the complete training program. So that's why it's a good one for the second day, because you'll get to see how all these pieces start to fit together and how this practice proceeds. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in the Eastern Park in the palace of Megara's mother. Then the Brahmin Ganaka Moggallana went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and said to the Blessed One, Master Gotama, in this palace of Megara's mother, there can be seen gradual training, gradual progress, and gradual practice and gradual progress, that is, down to the last step of the staircase. So in other words, the palace is built bit by bit by the architects. Among these Brahmins, too, there can be seen gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress, that is, in study. And among archers, too, there can be seen gradual training, that is, in archery. And also among accountants, like us, who earn our living by accountancy, there can be seen gradual training, that is, in computation. So Ganaka actually means uh, accountant. That's his name, Ganaka Moggallana, but it's, this is his profession. For when we get an apprentice, first we make him count one one, two twos, three threes, four fours, five fives, six sixes, seven sevens, eight eights, nine nines, ten tens, and we make him count a hundred too. Can you imagine being an accountant before the calculator? It's a rough job. No Excel spreadsheets. Miserable. Now, is it also possible, Master Gotama, to describe gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress in this Dhamma and discipline? So now we get the, the full training regimen. It is possible, Brahman, to describe gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress in this Dhamma and discipline. Now, what he's going to go through is three different phases of the training, essentially, and that is sila, leading to samadhi, and then panya. In other words, virtue, leading to collectedness and meditation, and then wisdom. Just as Brahman, when a clever horse trainer obtains a fine thoroughbred colt, he first makes him get used to wearing the bit and afterwards trains him further. So when the Tathagata, the Tathagata is how the Buddha refers to himself, and it means thus gone, one who's thus gone. So, uh, and afterwards trains him further. So when the Tathagata obtains a person to be tamed, he first disciplines him thus. So this is actually this analogy of the Buddha as a trainer of men, just as we might train in animals, a common analogy in the suttas. And I think it's a pretty good analogy in the sense that 
we're really training ourselves. We're training the mind and we're gaining some control over more, let's say, primal parts of the brain, like the, the limbic system and the brain stem. And these are more habitual patterns that lead us towards suffering and mental agitation. And so, of course, what he's laid out is, is the ultimate antidote to that. Come bhikkhu, be virtuous, restrained with the restraint of the, pat, of the padimokkha. And the padimokkha is the Buddhist monastic code. And there's uh, 227 different rules for a fully ordained monk and 311 for a venerable abhasa. So you all can be uh, thankful you only have eight on this retreat, the, the morning precepts. Be perfect in conduct and resort be, be perfect in conduct and resort, and seeing fear in the slightest fault, train by undertaking the training precepts. So this is the first foundational part of the practice. It's the training precepts that we took in the morning and that we'll take every morning. Why do we take the precepts? Corey? That came to me when I realized that it was basically permission to be a kind person. Absolutely, right. So you're, you're giving yourself permission to be a kind person. And what does that lead to? What's the, what are the benefits of this, let's say? Yep. Um, acting in harmless ways creates a stable mind. Right. So this is what we'll see in this training progress that the Buddha is laying out here. But essentially, the, the precepts are creating a balanced mind, a mind that can get into samadhi, that can be collected. Um, he says, seeing fear in the slightest fault. And that seeing fear comes from recognizing cause and effect. It, it comes from seeing that if you break a precept, in other words, if you have a bad intention, that there's a direct comic effect of that, which is suffering for yourself either immediately afterwards in some cases, or it might take longer. But seeing this cause and effect and seeing dependent origination, which we'll get to more later in the retreat, but essentially seeing this chain of causality leads you to see fear in even the slightest uh, breach of the, of the training precepts. And I can think of an example when I was younger, I was about four years old and my neighborhood friend that I was playing with had this really cool Lego block. And I was obsessed with Legos at the time. We actually had a small room of the house devoted to Legos called the Lego room, just so we wouldn't step on these sharp pieces uh, throughout the house. And he had this cool block that was a, essentially a chef with like a round pizza a uh, pizza dough piece, uh, pizza pie. And I don't know why, but at, the, at that age, I thought this was the coolest uh, little Lego block, and I just stole it from him, put it in my, <laughs> put it in my uh, pocket, and went home from the play date. And then I felt so guilty about this later that I confessed to my mom, and she had me go and uh, apologize to him. But it just, it just weighed on my mind. It was like I couldn't keep that block without feeling like this is wrong. I need to give this back. So it created all this suffering for me. And then the fact that that memory came up later in meditation, uh, even just this year, just shows you that little breach just haunted me, uh, you know, decades later. And if I'd known the effects of breaking that precept, I never would have done so. So this, as your mindfulness gets sharper and as your collectedness gets sharper, it's also a feedback loop where the collected mind can see cause and effect more readily. And in other words, you can, uh, you'll naturally just keep your precepts easier. You'll naturally be more virtuous because you'll see how this is just a way to have a mind that's at ease and at peace all the time. When Brahman the bhikkhu is virtuous and seeing fear in the slightest fault, trains by undertaking the training precepts, then the Tathagata disciplines him further. Come, bhikkhu, guard the doors of your sense faculties. On seeing a form with the eye, do not grasp at its signs and features. Since if you were to leave the eye faculty unguarded, evil, unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade you. 
practice the way of its restraint. Guard the eye faculty, undertake the restraint of the eye faculty. On hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching a tangible with the body, on cognizing a mind object with the mind, do not grasp at its signs and features. Since if you were to leave the mind faculty unguarded, evil, unwholesome states might invade you. Practice the way of its restraint. Guard the mind faculty. Undertake the restraint of the mind faculty. So there's a couple things to unpack there. First, he's talking about guarding the doors of the six sense base. In other words, your five senses plus the mind uh, sense, like your thoughts. And don't grasp at the different signs and features that might appear at any of those six sense bases. Basically what he's saying is there's going to be contact and feeling that's inevitable. It's, this is happening, you know, millions of times a moment. Um, but that's kind of, so that's the, again, dependent origination is something we'll discuss in more detail later in the retreat, but up to, after that point of contact, it's up to us whether that feeling can turn into craving and can create all sorts of agitation in the mind. And that's the point when you can use the six R's, when you realize after the feeling, when you recognize, okay, that feeling is getting away from me, it's turned into full-blown craving. Now I'm grasping after it, you know, it's, and then it's leading to the, the evil, unwholesome states, which are the obstacles or the hindrances. It's at that point that you apply the six R's. You notice, okay, I'm no longer with the feeling of loving kindness. I'm no longer with my spiritual friend and I need to apply the six R's, relax, release, relax, and let go of that obstacle, let go of the craving, and then just come back to being with the object. And this way it just stays at a feeling. It doesn't get um, elaborated into craving and suffering. So as an example, we might think about the dark chocolate at tea time. I'm a big fan of it. And so you might have your first piece of dark chocolate uh, or first couple pieces and you're enjoying it. That's the feeling. It's an enjoyable feeling and there's nothing wrong with that. But then what might follow from that feeling is craving. So now you're thinking, I'll bet I could get a, a couple more pieces of chocolate. But I wonder if anyone around here would see me do that and think I was greedy or something. And I wonder, maybe this is a good brand, this Lindt chocolate. Maybe I should order some on Amazon when I get home. And how long will that take to get to my house? Will it still be, will it be melted by the time I'm, you know? And so you're, just because that feeling has now gone into craving and into all these stories, it's gotten out of control. So essentially what he's saying by guard the, uh, the sense faculties is just to 6R when you notice that the the raw feeling has turned into full-blown craving. Okay, so the next part of the training. When Brahman the bhikkhu guards the doors of his sense faculties, then the Tathagata disciplines him further. Come bhikkhu, be moderate in eating. Reflect wisely. You should take food neither for amusement nor for intoxication nor for the sake of physical beauty and attractiveness, but only for the endurance and continuance of this body, for ending, for ending discomfort and for assisting the holy life, considering, thus I shall terminate old feelings without arousing new feelings, and I shall be healthy and blameless and shall live in comfort. So the Buddha was big on intermittent fasting. I think he started that trend. Um, of course, there were many other ascetics who were eating very little, but he really talked about a middle way between basically starving yourself and overindulging. But this part of the training can also be applied to other areas of overindulging in the senses. Because if you think about it, at the time of the Buddha, this was really the most indulgent thing someone could do other than probably to have sex. There was no Netflix at the time. There was no... 
uh, YouTube or Twitter. And so this part of the training also applies to your mental diet as well as your physical diet. In other words, what are you consuming throughout the day? What kind of mental inputs are you letting in that might cause agitation in the mind? Are you consuming a high calorie dopamine rich diet full of, uh, you know, social media and such, or are you consuming only what's really important to you, only what's worthwhile to you, and then leaving uh, space in your mind to, for meditation throughout the day? And, uh, you know, this really emphasizes, I think, the importance of this being an all the time practice, that we're always thinking and choosing wisely what to consume with the mind, which means whatever we pay, pay attention to that's really uh, affecting the mind on probably in a deeper way than we realize until we until we're on retreat and away from it all. And of course, the news cycle is vicious. And I can remember when I went to Bali, this was probably the first time that I fully unplugged for a month. I was away from the news. I wasn't reading anything. I wasn't going on electronics. And I was just doing this yoga teacher training program. And then I had this thought, like, I'm missing so much. The world's just moving so fast. Uh, there must be so much that I'll have to catch up on when I get off of retreat. And I called my brother, who's a pretty well-informed guy, and I said, so what did I miss the last month? And he said, well, I can't really think of anything. <laughs> I can't think of anything important, right? Because what seems important now is, isn't important two days from now, for the most part. So I'm not saying stop reading the news entirely necessarily, but just choosing wisely what we pay attention to and seeing as we do in the morning, uh, reciting the Dhammapada, noticing what's the essential and what's the unessential, what's important and what gets six hard. When Brahman, and also, I'll just say that there are a lot of benefits to intermittent fasting. Uh, you know, the reason for this precept is to, well, one, it's for the monks not to have to worry about food all day long, but also just to notice that there's certain benefits to your meditation practice when you, um, when you don't eat past noon, uh, which might not be feasible off retreat for you, but having some kind of uh, larger window there's many health benefits to intermittent fasting and certain, certainly meditation benefits. And it's a major part of many different spiritual traditions uh, will have days of fasting and such. So there's also the practical and literal food aspect of it. When Brahman the bhikkhu is moderate in eating, then the Tathagata disciplines him further. Come bhikkhu, be devoted to wakefulness. During the day, while walking back and forth and sitting, purify your mind of obstructive states. In the first watch of the night, while walking back and forth and sitting, purify your mind of obstructive states. In the middle watch of the night, you should lie down on the right side in the lion's pose, with one foot overlapping the other, mindful and fully aware, after noting in your mind the time for rising. I think Den uh, Delson mentioned this last night, but uh, just making an intention for what time am I going to get up in the morning? <coughs> and that'll come into play as your practice progresses with determinations, but you're basically just building the ability to set intentions and to gain control over that part of your mind, which is really quite remarkable that you can actually wake up sometimes to the minute on the dot uh, after a full night's sleep. So you might give that a try and Obviously, at the time of the Buddha, there were not uh, alarm clocks, but this is something he recommended. After rising in the third, after rising in the third watch of the night, walk, uh, while walking back and forth and sitting, purify your mind of obstructive states. So, being devoted to wakefulness means having the energy and putting in the right effort to six R all day long. And in doing so, you're purifying your mind of obstructive states, which are the, the hindrances. And we'll talk about those shortly, but these are basically, they cover the entirety of what would be a distraction in your mind, what would be an agitated mental state. So again, this part of the training, this um, fourth part of the training is really 
emphasizing that it's an all day practice, that your mental hygiene throughout the day determines how deep you get in your sitting. So if you've going back to number three, if you've been consuming a lot of social media and such, you might notice that leaves a certain mental residue that requires more six Ring when you actually sit down. But also if, if you're constantly purifying your mind throughout the day by being devoted to wakefulness, then it means you're six Ring all the time and you're just naturally cultivating a collected mind. And so insight might even arise during your daily walking meditation with this practice or while you're taking a shower or while you're using the restroom but it'll also make it that much easier to go very deep in your sitting meditation. And I don't think I fully appreciated this when I started out with the practice where I really just thought about the formal sitting as my meditation practice. And I didn't think about how everything that I was doing throughout the day was training a certain mindset and training a certain, um, was training the mind essentially. And this is neuroplasticity, the ability that we have to basically rewire our synapses and our neural connections depending on how we consciously apply our attention. So meditation has been called self-directed neuroplasticity by Dr. Rick Hansen, for example. Uh, he's got a good book called Buddha's Brain. And um, it's basically taking control of these automated habits and automated formations that we, some of which we're born with and some of which get conditioned into us over a lifetime. Um, and some, you know, some of which may come from previous lifetimes and basically taking control of that process by consciously reprogramming and reconditioning the mind by using the six R's. When Brahman the bhikkhu is devoted to wakefulness, then the Tathagata disciplines him further. Come bhikkhu, be possessed of mindfulness and full awareness. Act in full awareness when going forward and returning. Act in full awareness when looking ahead and looking away. Act in full awareness when flexing and extending your limbs. Act in full awareness when wearing your, wearing your robe and carrying your outer robe and bowl. Act in full awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food, and tasting. Act in full awareness when defecating and urinating. Act in full awareness when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking, and keeping silent. So this is the, the mindfulness component. And of course, they're all related, right? So this is related to uh, wakefulness and purifying your mind. But this is an emphasis on being aware all the time. There's a, a Harvard study that's often quoted, I think it was from 2010, where they found that people spend 47% of the day on average lost in thought. And on average, most of those thoughts are negative because they're ruminating about the past or worrying about the future. And um, I think it's actually much higher than that. Uh, their study design was to send people little notifications on their phone and ask them if they were paying attention. So of course, if they answer the notification, then they couldn't have been that present. So anyways, if you just observe your own mind, you can see what percentage of the day am I, am I just unaware that I'm at where I am or what I'm doing. But uh, that study was called the human mind is a wander, or the conclusion was a human mind is a wandering mind and a, and a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. So we're also just generally happier if we're in the present. And the way that mindfulness is defined uh, by Bhante is remembering to observe how a mind's attention moves from one object to the next, from one thing to the next. So in psychological terms, we might say remembering to have your metacognition online, remembering to observe your mind constantly. And the, the key part of that is you're not controlling your mind. A lot of times the, def, the definition of mindfulness implies that you're using your mind like a laser beam and you're uh, you know, intentionally finding things to note with it or controlling it in some way or another. And um, if you're controlling the mind, you won't see how the mind actually works on its own. You might not see the impersonal nature 
of uh, how the mind works and how it's all a dependently arisen impersonal process. When Brahman the bhikkhu possesses mindfulness and full awareness, then the Tathagata disciplines him further. Come bhikkhu, resort to a secluded resting place, the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, a heap of straw, Dhammasukha meditation center. <laughs> He resorts to a secluded resting place, the forest, a heap of straw. On returning from his alms round, after his meal, he sits down, folding his leg crosswise, setting his body erect, and establishing mindfulness before him. Now he's going to go through the five hindrances, the five obstacles. Abandoning Abandoning covetousness for the world, he abides with a mind free from covetousness. He purifies his mind from covetousness. Covetousness is a fancy word for desire, or it's the I like it mind. So how does, how does this person purify their mind of covetousness? The six R's, right? Abandoning ill will and hatred, he abides with a mind free from ill will, compassionate for the welfare of all beings. He purifies his mind from ill will and hatred. So ill will and hatred, that's the I don't like it mind. That's aversion. Abandoning sloth and torpor, he abides free from sloth and torpor, percipient of light, mindful and fully aware. He purifies his mind from sloth and torpor. So this is uh, dullness of mind or sleepiness. Sometimes your head might start bobbing even. And it says percipient of light, which is one of the antidotes actually. You can even meditate outside. Uh, it can be helpful uh, if there's a lot of sloth and torpor. And there's other strategies that uh, Delson will probably talk about more that you can use if there's a lot of sloth and torpor there. Abandoning restlessness and remorse, he abides unagitated with a mind inwardly peaceful. He purifies his mind from res restlessness and remorse. Abandoning doubt, so this is the fifth hindrance, doubt. He abides having gone beyond doubt, unperplexed about, un about wholesome states. He purifies his mind from doubt. So doubt can be, am I doing the practice right? What's a wholesome state of mind? What's an unwholesome state of mind? Um, it can also be doubt in yourself. Self-doubt is a pretty common obstacle, especially in these early days of the retreat. Uh, or doubt in the teacher, doubt in the, doubt in the teaching. So this person has sat down and they've just abandoned the five hindrances. They haven't done any, they haven't single-pointedly focused their mind on anything. They've just let go of the five hindrances. That's it. They've just purified their mind of all of the, of the five obstacles that account for every distraction that could arise in the mind. And then what happens next? Having thus abandoned these five hindrances, imperfections of the mind that weaken wisdom, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, he enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. The jhanas are levels of understanding and levels of cessation. And there's a big talk on that tomorrow that Bhante gives. It's a recording uh, where he goes into more detail about each of the jhanas. But what's important to notice here is that this person has gotten into the first jhana just by abandoning all the, all, all the obstacles. As soon as they're not present, then naturally the seven enlightenment factors come into play and the mind is in jhana. And um, this first jhana, it's, uh, he's secluded from un unwholesome states and um, secluded from sensual pleasures. So the mind has really turned inward away from the sense faculties. And of course, it's a very uh, joyful experience. And at this stage, there's still 
applied and sustained thought, which means basically that kind of starter fuel for the loving kindness, just having the intention there and having even a phrase there at that point. With the stilling of applied and sustained thought, he enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of, concent- born of collectedness. I don't use the word concentration because people often take that to mean really single-pointedly forcing the mind to do something. But um, again, it's just a collected mind that's free of the obstacles. And the second jhana, the the chatter, or the rather the applied and sustained thought has died down. So now the mind's very quiet. And this was also what the Buddha called noble silence. With the fading away as well of rapture, he abides in equanimity. And mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce, he has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. So now even that joy, even that pleasure is taken to be a little bit of mental agitation. And so the mind calms down to an even deeper level where it's equanimity and mindfulness. And there's still a little bit of uh, kind of pleasant feeling in the body, but it's really that kind of more coarse joy has really settled down. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, he enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. So we can see here how the full training program, starting with the virtue and then after virtue, uh, guarding the, the different faculties, having moderation in both physical and mental diet, having wakefulness and mindfulness, and finally sitting down for meditation, and just letting go of, the at that point, the hindrances just fall away, because this person has completed the, the full training regimen, and they naturally find themselves in jhana. And um, this will, so this is the samadhi piece now, the right collectedness, the, the meditation piece of the, of the practice, and this will lead to panya, or wisdom, naturally. And um, there is a connection between the precepts and these five hindrances that were mentioned. It's not necessary, not necessarily will every precept, will every hindrance result from a broken precept. Well, this is my opinion, that not every um, obstacle that comes up will be the direct result of of breaking one of these precepts, but there is certainly a correlation. So... Uh, killing and harming living beings, which is the first precept taken, which obstacle do you think that might lead to? So remember the five obstacles again were restlessness, desire, doubt, dullness, and aversion. So killing and harming living beings, what kind of mental state might that lead to? Aversion. Exactly, aversion. And then the second precept, right, not stealing, what kind of mental state might that lead to? Covetousness? I'm sorry? Covetousness? Sorry, greed? Greed? Yeah, so it could also lead to desire or greed. Um, we also might say restlessness, because if you've just taken something that you shouldn't have, you might feel like, I wonder if someone saw me do that, or I wonder if someone's going to uh, catch me for that, or whatever it is. And then sensual misconduct. What, what might that lead to? Right, craving or desire. And then lying. Which of the obstacles is that linked to? Exactly. Because if you lie, you can't even trust yourself if you've lied enough. You might have a lot of self-doubt at that point. And you also 
won't trust others as much if you're constantly lying. And then uh, finally, intoxicants. Intoxicants. Sloth and torpor. Sloth and torpor, yeah. So kind of interesting, right? These five precepts line up with the five hindrances. And um, it's just a way not to beat yourself up over, oh, which hindrance or which precept did I break in the past or whatever it is, but just seeing that there is a, a direct connection between the virtue part of the training and your sitting meditation practice. The other thing that I'll note is that the, the obstacles shouldn't be seen as enemies. They're not out to get you. They're not worth fighting with. These are actually your friends. They're showing you where your mindfulness isn't sharp. They're showing you where you need to work on uh, using the six R's to let go of something. And they're actually, they can all be linked to different survival instincts. So when you think about it, your mind is trying its best to be happy and it's trying its best to keep you alive and uh, reproduce and such. So, for example, aversion is often, I mean, this is a, something we should feel towards things that would have uh, once caused us harm. Or restlessness is, um, and anxiety could be the result of, in our ancestors' time, not knowing if there's a lion that's going to jump out of the, the jungle. Or, um, of course, desire, you know, kept, kept our ancestors procreating and uh, doubt is, is uh, useful if you're not sure who to trust and uh, uh, sloth and torpor because our body does need to rest at some point. So they're all natural instincts. There's no reason to see them as enemies. There's no reason to fight with them. It's just that when we're in meditation and also in the modern world where there's no longer a use for um, for example, there's no line that's going to jump out of the thicket at us, we can just realize that we don't, even though the mind's doing its best to help us out, we just don't need these obstacles in our way when we're meditating. There's a much higher state of uh, consciousness and a much deeper way of being, which are these jhanas, which then lead to wisdom, and then this leads to liberation from, from suffering. So, again, there's no use in trying to battle with the hindrances or to see them as, uh, as enemies or to judge ourselves for having them. These are c completely normal and everyone has them. Everyone's born with them. It's just that as we let them go, we can see that there's a better way of being and the mind will naturally be in jhana. This is my instruction, Brahman, to those bhikkhus who are in the higher training, whose minds have not yet attained the goal, who abide aspiring to the supreme security from bondage. But these things conduce, conduce both to a pleasant abiding here and now and to mindfulness and full awareness for those bhikkhus who are arhats with taints destroyed, who have lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached their own goal destroyed the fetters of being, and are completely liberated through final knowledge. So he's saying this is going to feel good now, it's going to feel good right away, and also even once you've become an arahat and completed the, the goal of this training, you'll still just naturally do this on your own because it's just what an arahat does and it feels good. When this was said, the Brahmin Ganaka Moggallana asked the Blessed One, When Master Gotama's disciples are thus advised and instructed by him, do they all attain Nibbana, the ultimate goal, or do some not attain it? Interesting question. So he's... Basically, it's, are you guaranteeing success if I follow this path? It doesn't sound so easy necessarily. So if I'm going to put in the effort, am I definitely going to get to Nibbana? I think it's a fair question. When Brahman they are thus advised and instructed by me, some of my disciples attain Nibbana, the ultimate goal, and some do not attain it. Master Gotama, since Nibbana exists and the path leading to Nibbana exists, and Master Gotama is present as the guide, what is the cause and reason why, when Master Gotama's disciples are thus advised and instructed by him, some of them attain Nibbana, the ultimate goal, and some do some do not attain it.
What do you all think? Why do some people not attain Nibbana? Not practicing. Not practicing? Not practicing at all? <laughs> not, or poorly. Or poorly, right. So, as to that, Brahman, I will ask you a question in return. Answer it as you choose. What do you think, Brahman? Are you familiar with the road leading to, leading to Rajagaha? Rajagaha was a, the capital city of Magadha, which is a uh, kingdom at the time of the Buddha. And they actually date, based on the pottery, they think Rajagaha is from about at least 1000 BC. It was existing. And uh, the Buddha gave a lot of teachings there because he was gifted like a, a grove, essentially. Yes, Master Gotama, I am familiar with the road leading to Rajagaha. What do you think, Brahman? Suppose a man came who wanted to go to Rajagaha, and he approached you and said, Venerable Sir, I want to go to Rajagaha. Show me the road to Rajagaha. Then you told him, Now, good man, this road goes to Rajagaha. Follow it for a while, and you will see a certain village. Go a little further, and you will see a certain town. Go a little further, and you will see Rajagaha, with its lovely parks, groves, meadows, and ponds. So this was, you know, back in the day when they would say, go a little past that and then go a little past that and you might see this on the left. So things are a little easier now. We just say, Siri, get me to Rajagaha. <laughs> Siri, get me to Nibbana. <laughs> then having been thus advised and instructed by you, he would take a wrong road and would go to the west. Then a second man who wanted to go to Rajagaha and he approached you and said, Venerable Sir, I want to go to Rajagaha. Show me the road to Rajagaha. Then you told him, Now good man, this road goes to Rajagaha. Follow it for a while and you will see Rajagaha with its lovely parks, groves, meadows and ponds. Then having been thus advised and instructed by you, he would, safely, he would arrive safely in Rajagaha. Now Brahman, since Rajagaha exists and the path leading to Rajagaha exists, and you are present as the guide. What is the cause and reason why, when those men have been thus advised and instructed by you, one man takes a wrong road and goes to the west, and one arrives safely in Rajagaha? What can I do about that, Master Gotama? I am one who shows the way. So too, Brahman, Nibbana exists, and the path leading to Nibbana exists, and I am present as the guide. Yet when my disciples have been thus advised and instructed by me, some of them attain Nibbana, the ultimate goal, and some do not attain it. What can I do about that, Brahman? The Tathagata is one who shows the way. So he's really putting the burden on us to do the practice. He's given the instructions. And it's like that classic analogy of the finger pointing to the moon. And some people just look at the teacher and bow down, but it's really, he's just pointing the way. He's just pointing the way. Not that there's anything wrong, of course, with uh, devotion, but just rites and rituals won't get us to Nibbana, right? When this was said, the Brahman Ganaka Moggallana said to the Blessed One, there are persons who are faithless and have gone forth from the home life into homelessness, not out of faith, but seeking a livelihood, who are fraudulent, deceitful, treacherous, haughty, hollow, personally vain, rough-tongued, loose-spoken, unguarded in their sense faculties, immoderate in eating, undevoted to wakefulness, unconcerned with recluseship, not greatly respectful of training, luxurious, careless, leaders in backsliding, neg neglectful of seclusion, lazy, Wanting an energy, unmindful, not fully aware, unconcentrated, with straying minds, devoid of wisdom, drivelers. Master Gotama does not dwell together with these. It's a harsh rebuke of the, uh, of the person who doesn't follow the training. But there are clansmen who have gone forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness who are not fraudulent, deceitful, treacherous, haughty, hollow, personally vain, rough-tongued, and loose-spoken, who are guarded in their sense faculties, moderate in eating, devoted to wakefulness, concerned with recluseship, greatly respectful of training, not luxurious or careless, 
who are keen to avoid backsliding, leaders in seclusion, energetic, resolute, established in mindfulness, fully aware, concentrated with unified minds, possessing wisdom, not drivelers. These meditators are here now at Dhammasuka Meditation Center. <laughs> Master Gotama dwells together with these. Just as black orris root is reckoned as the best of root perfumes and red sandalwood is reckoned as the best of wood perfumes and jasmine is reckoned as the best of flower perfumes, so too Master Gotama's advice is supreme among the teachings of today. There were many teachers at the time of the Buddha and in some of the other suttas you'll get to see how he challenged their different views and their different practices. And of course today there's probably even more uh, different teachings and paths and views. And so um, not, all, not all roads lead to Rome. Magnificent Master Gotama, Magnificent Master Gotama. Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been overturned, o revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Gotama for refuge, and to the Dhamma, and to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. Let Master Gotama remember me, remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. So that's the full training program. Now it's up to you all. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I, I think we can only speculate on this and I'll give my answer and then maybe Delson can add anything. But, um, you know, there's a couple of things to take into account here. The first is that he's speaking to monks who are really gunning for our hardship. And so these are people who already have very energetic and clear minds and um, by this part of the training, right? Because this is stage four. So um, they're also living at a time when there's much less stimuli. So their mind isn't having this push-pull uh, all day long with different stimuli being bombarded. So they may have needed less sleep. And um, there also might have been less of a clear distinction in terms of they didn't have specific watches or they didn't have clocks. So the first watch of the night, for all we know, could have been, um, you know, until the moon was at a certain height, and then the second watch may have began at dawn or whatever it is. Um, if it is the case that it was di exactly divided into three four-hour shifts, and the monks were only sleeping for four hours, that is possible. But again, I would think about the historical context and also what level of training they were at at that stage. Um, so, I mean, we haven't found that to be necessary here. In fact, it's encouraged that you get eight hours of sleep and then even take like naps throughout the day if you need it. Um, your body will kind of tell you how much rest you need. And I think it's also similar to the not overindulging in food where your body will tell you what you need, but then obviously you don't want to just laze around in bed all day. So there's just kind of that middle way of listening to your body and seeing what's going to be conducive to good meditation. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have to be tricky, right? Because that's really one of the obstacles in that case. That's probably restlessness. And my advice would be to six are the few, the first few urges to get up. So let's say, so you should start sitting longer and longer, at least sitting for an hour and then or at least sitting for half an hour and then sitting longer and longer. But you might get these, your meditation might be very nice and then you just get this thought like, well, there's not much happening or whatever, I should just get up now. But when that first thought comes up, I would 6R it. And I would 6R the first, couple, first few thoughts that say I should get up. Because what you might find is when you 6R, then your meditation actually goes really deep after that. And it was just some kind of restlessness yeah. Well, when your object of meditation is the loving kindness, you're aware of the loving kindness. And um, 
it's it's infusing this open field of awareness, but you're still staying with that feeling. In other words, you're not ti- you're not tightly clenching around it, such that the only sensations appearing in your attention camera, it, you don't want your attention camera lens to be like this, but it's more of just this open awareness that's kind of collected around the loving kindness. So in other words, your awareness isn't such that it's going everywhere like there's a bird and it's going over there and there's this and that it's just staying with the loving kindness within that field of awareness and you're just watching it radiate out on its own or staying with your spiritual friend if that's your object yeah okay let's share some merit may suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be and the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief May all beings share this merit to have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, Devas and Nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.